Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Last time, we got perspective correct texture mapping working, and that's awesome, because as you can see with this triangle, we can draw whatever texture we want with on the triangle, and it looks like the texture has the same depth that the vertices do, and that is great. But, a whole idea of 3D rendering is generally not how you can draw one triangle the best, it's how you can draw this excellent shape made from a lot of triangles. So in this video, we're going to take our first steps into having multi-triangle meshes on screen. So we're going to try getting one such mesh on screen today. We're going to examine some of the issues that comes from the naive way of doing it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we can correct that. And by the end of this, we'll have a nice basic shape spinning around on screen that's not just a triangle. So with that, let's go ahead and let's get started. Now, as you may have noticed, our triangle no longer has, well, a randomly generated texture on it. The texture is actually a set of bricks loaded from a file. And you might be wondering, wait a minute, but you didn't write any file loading code on screen. What's up with that? Well, ultimately, I decided to go ahead and write all the texture and model loading code off screen because, well, it's not the main focus of the series. And I don't want to distract from, well, the main focus, which is software rendering. If you're interested in it, though, it's the same texture and model loading code I used in the 3D game engine series, just adapted slightly for our code base. So, if you're really interested in it, you can find out more about it there. But just as a quick rundown of what I did, it's all on GitHub, is the bitmap class now has a new constructor, which loads a file, or takes in a file name to load the file. The index, wait, sorry, the OBJ model class is a new class for specifically loading OBJ files, OBJ models. And here it is. And also it has a method to convert it to an indexed model, which is our final new class. I don't know what I changed there, but okay. And the, in the index model, this is sort of our intermediate representation. It just has a whole bunch of lists of various vertex data, and we can pick and choose what, it, what parts of these data we want to use to, well, construct our list of vertices. So that is what we have. Hopefully that's not too confusing. So now, let's go ahead and let's use this to, to create, well, a mesh class, something that actually stores, well, a 3D mesh. So, in our mesh, we're going to have a private list of vertex for the vertices. And that makes sense. We have a square, has four vertices, so this list would store those four vertices. Simple enough. The part that seems to confuse people sometimes is that we actually want a second list, a list of integers for indices. And what this is, is it's a list of, well, indexes into the vertex array. And this is going to be used to determine how we should draw those vertices in terms of triangles. And historically, these two lists and the way they work together has always seemed to confuse some people. So, I'm going to briefly go through how this works. So, let's say we're trying to draw a square. It has four vertices that I'm going to call A, B, C, and D, just to call them something. Now, like I said, we have a list of the vertices. So, here's our vertex list. And lists, you can access them with indices, just like arrays. So, A is at index 0, B is at index 1, C is at index 2, and D is at index 3. Now, how do we draw these vertices in terms of triangles? I mean, we don't have a fill square function, we have a fill triangle function. So, the way we do this is with the index list. We'll specify indices 0, 2, and 3. And then we look at our vertex array. 0 gives us vertex A, 2 gives us vertex C, and 3 gives us vertex D. So it gives us these vertices. And when we pass these vertices into the fill triangle function, what do you know? We get the first half of our square. And what about the, for the second half? Well, we specify index 0, 3, and 1. Index 0 gives us vertex A, 
index 3 gives us vertex D, and index 1 gives us vertex B. So A, D, and B. We pass those into the fill triangle function. And there we go. We get the second part of our triangle filled in. And what do you know? We've drawn a square. So this is just a nice, easy way to specify how to draw a bunch of vertices in terms of triangles without duplicating the vertices all over the place. We just need one vertex list, one list of indices, and there we go. That's the way this works. So for the rest of our mesh, all we really need is a constructor. So public mesh is going to take in some string file name. And how are we going to load it? Well, we're going to eventually need an indexed model. And this is going to but we can only load into an OBJ model. You can implement other file formats if you want. I've just implemented the OBJ file format because it's simple and common. So I'm going to create new OBJ model from the file name. That'll load the model, do whatever. But this has a method to indexed model. So there we go. We load an OBJ model, convert it to an indexed model. Exactly what we want. Oh, except I forgot to name. So I'll just call it model. Now, our vertices are going to just be, oh, I'll say, a new array list of vertex. Simple enough. I really actually don't need to initialize indices, but I do need to initialize vertices, because we're going to do a for loop here. I'm going to go through i is less than model dot get positions. Okay, apparently it doesn't have it, but get positions dot size. And the whole point of this is so that in our vertex array, our actual vertex array, we can add, well, the vertex information we need. So this provides a whole bunch of different information, it provides normals, tangents, a whole bunch of stuff we don't care about for our purposes. So we can sort of just pick and choose what information we need for our vertices. So I'm going to create a new vertex of model.getpositions.getI. Sorry? Yeah, never mind. That's right. <laughs> That'll get us a position. Actually, I'll put this on a new line, just so it's a little bit easier to see. And model.getTextCoords.getI. So there, we have positions and texture coordinates. That's all we care about for now. And finally, for our indices, we can actually just take this directly from the model. We just say model.getIndices, and we're done. So there we go. And to save time, I went ahead and did the getters off screen. We just need a getter for the vertex, a getter for the index, and a getter for the total number of indices in our index list. So with that, let's go to render context. Because we actually want a new method now. We're not just filling in individual triangles, we're filling in entire meshes. So I'm going to create public void draw triangle, or not draw triangle, draw mesh, excuse me. And this is going to be the method we use to, well, draw meshes. It's going to take in some mesh to draw. It's going to take in some matrix for F for the transform. And it's going to take in some bitmap for the texture that we want to, you know, draw on the mesh. So it's as simple as that. But how do we actually draw it? Well, our mesh has all the information we need to draw it as a group of triangles. So what we're going to, going to do is we're going to do a for loop. For i equals 0, i is less than m, wait, sorry, mesh.get num indices. And, and we're actually going to do plus equals 3. Why plus equals 3? Because there's three vertices in a triangle. So we're going to sort of use the indices three at a time. And what we're going to do here, pretty simple. We're going to call fill triangle. And we're going to use mesh.getVertex. Be careful here. And we're going to pass in mesh.getIndex sub i. It, I know it's a little tricky because you got to remember you're using the list of indices to find the index in the list of vertices. But yeah. Other than that, though, it's really the same process for all the vertices, except we're just going to use index i plus 1 and i plus 2 for the rest. 
and also we're going to pass in the texture. So there we go. And that should be all we really need to do to draw a mesh. And I forgot something. For our vertices, we actually want to transform them. We want to apply the, you know, the transform. So, sorry about that, I just, I completely forgot. Oh, there. So this way they're in the, you know, actual position they should be in when you fill in the mesh. So, there. Now, there's also a few small issues I had in mesh. I forgot. Add is lowercase, sorry about that. Missed a few imports. And we should throw an IO exception here. And the reason we're throwing it rather than handling it is because, well, there's really nothing in particular we, we should do to handle. We should just leave that up to whoever's using us. Now, in main.java, we're going to go ahead and put together some test code. So I'm going to say mesh, mesh, new mesh. I'm going to use dot slash res slash icosphere.obj. This is some mesh. It's on GitHub, and it's in the res form. So there you go. And all we should have to do is say target dot draw mesh. You should be able to pass in mesh, transform, transform, no, transform, and texture. And we should be able to build. And if we run, hey, it's very strange. <laughs> you might think there's something horribly wrong with our code, but what's really happening is our triangles are drawing just fine, our triangle code is fine, the mesh is being loaded and drawn just fine, the problem is with draw order. Some triangles are being drawn and just overwriting the pixels in the other. And this is a problem when some of the pixels that should be behind, should be on the back of the sphere, overwrite pixel that should be on the front of the sphere. And that creates, especially when that's inconsistent, it creates a very odd looking effect. So how do we handle this? How do we make it so that the pixels in front always show up on front? So, here's our sphere again, with a new texture, just to spice things up a bit. Now, something you might notice is the triangles on the sphere can really be divided into two types. There's triangles that are behind the sphere, from the camera's perspective, and there's triangles that are in front of the sphere, from the camera's perspective. And you might notice that we should never need to see the triangles behind the sphere. I mean, the triangles behind the sphere, they're just going to get covered up by the triangles in front of the sphere. So really, we don't even need to draw those. And if we don't draw them, well, then there's no issue anymore. We can't overwrite pixels because we're only drawing the front of the sphere and there's nothing behind them. So that's our trick. All we have to do is determine what triangles are in front of the sphere from the camera's perspective, what triangles are behind the sphere from the camera's perspective, and only draw those in front. But how do we do that? All we have to do is look at what direction the triangle is facing. If it's facing towards the camera, it's in front of the sphere. If it's facing away from the camera, it's behind the sphere. Simple as that. And the way we calculate that goes a little something like this. So we've got a triangle with some vertices. If we do B minus A and C minus A, we get the edges, E1 and E2. If we take the cross product of those, that gets us the normal. And what's the normal? It's what direction the triangle's facing. But it gets even better, because we don't even need the full normal. All we really care about is whether or not it's facing the camera, right? We can actually determine that with just the Z component of the normal. Because, well, if the Z component's greater than zero, as it should be the triangle's facing away from the camera, I sort of wrote that wrong, sorry. But yeah, we we can determine whether or not it's facing the camera. And that is back face culling in a nutshell. So let's go ahead and do it. But it gets even better, because we actually ha already have code to do this in our triangle area times 2 function. This is taking vertex B minus A, vertex C minus A, so that's giving us the two edges. And this is the cross product for the Z component. It's as simple as that. So, with that, we can take this exact same check that we were doing for the handedness, and if this is true, we just return. So I return, and if you look, there you go. All the back triangles are no longer being drawn because we're successfully detecting whether or not they face the camera, 
and the sphere looks just fine now. So there you go, We're, we've got a mesh, it's being appropriately drawn. But as you may notice, this back face culling thing sounds very hackish, and it kinda is. It only works with completely solid objects, solids that are completely enclosed, and objects that are completely convex. So objects like spheres, cubes, pyramids, cones, things like that. And a lot of objects we want to draw simply aren't convex. How can we handle objects like that? What do we need to do? Find out next time on the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and I'll see you next time.